the topic today is web performance optimization. I'm quite keen to give a review on what um, how you guys approach it. Um, so this is a really short presentation, um, informal, so ask questions as you go. Uh, it's around you know, the need for speed. I'm a certified Hoonian, so I can really uh, appreciate the <laughs> as Kieran can attest to. So we've explored techniques for measuring user performance and uh, how that correlates with you know, um, business metrics, commercial metrics. I usually find there's two or three key metrics that you try to correlate to um, to, you know, to try and um, uh, provide that kind of correlation with. And also, find there's a tool for engaging the business in uh, top of um, performance optimization. So, uh, without further ado, thank you, thank you. Um, thanks for uh, uh, inviting us here as well, Darren. Um, so, Darren said he was a, a, a non technical salesman. I'm a, I'm a really non technical salesman. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, when, when um, Trevor invited me to talk today, I thought, well, what do I talk about to a, a, a bunch of capacity and performance technical guys? So, well, well stick with my comfort zone and I'll, I'll give a sales pitch. Um, but before you all get up and leave, it's not a sales pitch for NCC Group or the services we do, it's a sales pitch for performance optimization. It's um, an ad adaptation of a presentation we give to our customers on a regular basis to help them promote performance optimization within their business. So our customers are DevOps, WebOps guys, uh, they'll use, be using our performance tools to uh, monitor, measure, uh, and obviously optimize their, their, their websites. And they, they say, we, we get the problem, we get why performance is important, but we need more buy-in from the business. Um, so, so that's the, the sort of um, orientation for this presentation. It might not be quite as short as I intended it to be, so do uh, tap your watch if I'm uh, rattling on too much. Um, and whilst it's not, a, it's not a sales pitch, as I say, I do well, just want to give a little bit of background um, about who I am, who NCC Group is, because I'm guessing that many of you have never heard of us before. We're a £400 million market cap um, UK headquartered business um, focused on information assurance, uh, website performance testing is a, is a small part of that. We have um, a, a huge presence in the UK, obviously, and, and significant presence in, in the US, and we have, latest count, 12 in Australia. So a lot of opportunity for us to, to grow within, within Australia. Our, our business is focused around three main divisions, escrow, um, software escrow contracts, um, uh, code storage and verification services. Domain services, we own Trust. We're bidding with, against Amazon for DocSecure so that we can provide a top level domain that is a secure um, internet uh, platform, website web platform. Um, and the assurance division. The assurance division is um, predominantly composed of um, uh, uh, security and penetration testing, audit, audit and compliance, um, but also some traditional functional software testing. Um, and obviously the website performance business, which is our interest in the CMG. The web, website performance business, I apologise for this slide, lots of names on it, but um, we are a significant player within the UK market. We work with a number of uh, big organisations providing um, external website performance testing services. And through that, we've evolved into a business that's able to offer a lot of consultants and professional services around how to optimise um, websites. So that's, that's where we come, come from um, in this world. Um, that's where we get to the point where our customers are saying, okay, we need help in getting our businesses to, um, to uh, buy into the optimization piece. So that's it, no more, no more trying to sell us. You now know who we are, um, and that's my piece over. Um, so the need for speed, what, what's this all about? We, the, the, if you talk to an e-commerce manager about what their priorities for their web platform are, they're all sorts of different different things, this is, uh, you know, functionality comes top, platform, aesthetics, marketing, um, performance is, is very low down the, the pecking order, but we know it's important and, and uh, you know, our DevOps guys, WebOps guys, they, they want to drive performance just for, purely from the perspective of um, uh, capacity planning, um, uh, the ability to save on resources, they want to drive um, performance from that perspective, 
But of course, the business cares about what's going to give them the most money. Um, and, and performance is directly correlated to uh, a number of important commercial metrics within the e-commerce world. Um, some interesting studies that our, our friends, um, sorry, so no, uh, starting with um, uh, a subject that's been around for, for many years, longer since before I was even born, uh, looking at the um, uh, perception of response time. So what, uh, based on some studies that Robert Miller did in 1968, we look at the, uh, how, how, does, how do we react to response time? So anything under 100 milliseconds is instant. Uh, anything between 100 and milliseconds and a second is, is seamless. And it's, so we can, we can contain, uh, manage our train of thought, thought through the transactional process. Um, up to 10 seconds and we start disengaging altogether. So um, if you've got your, your 10 second loading web pages, um, it's, it's, it's bad, bad news for you. Um, uh, and interestingly, our, our um, perception of performance is different to reality as well. We perceive performance as actually worse than it actually is. So um, we, we, if uh, a page takes a second to download, we're say, perceiving it as over a second. So the recounting experience is worse. So that when you actually come back, come out of a, an experience where you've been navigating a poor performing website, your um, reaction is that it's, it's worse than it actually is. Um, it, three seconds is, the, um, is the, the point in time that an Akamai study said that we needed to be able to get that pages to download with them to keep customers engaged. Uh, and the sad fact is that um, we're nowhere near that. According to uh, Strange Loops uh, study, there was, um, they looked at the top 2,000 website, global websites according to the Alexia rankings. Um, the average page load was 6.4 seconds. Um, in Australia, uh, I sad to say it's even worse, where the average speed of the home page for the retailers in the Father's Day click frenzy that was recent was, was uh, over 10 seconds. So you can see we're automatically already in that disengaging zone um, for response time. And that's stressful. Uh, our good friends at CA did a, um, uh, an experiment with a company called Fobians many years ago where they uh, put EEGs on, on, um, on subjects heads and, uh, and interviewed them afterwards about their experience and there was no, no question the uh, experience was very stressful for them when they were in the deliberately hobbled um, uh, website so they gave them retail tasks go and buy a, a laptop on a, on a typical e-commerce platform um, and they had one set of subjects uh, running at five megs, one set of subjects running at two megs um, uh, and the results both from the brain activity but also from the um, interviews afterwards were that the, it was a far more stressful experience. And of course, in the, in the bricks and mortars retail world, we've spent hundreds of years trying to make the experience as stress-free as possible, you know, even down to elevator music, um, trying to remove the stress because stress buyers, stress customers don't buy. You know, they want to get out of the shop as quickly as possible. Um, Tammy Evers, a, um, a performance engineer at, uh, at Bradway, formerly Strangely, did a, a follow-up with a, a number of our customers in the UK, uh, looking at their mobile sides. So we looked, she looked at John Lewis, Tesco, uh, EasyJet, Ryanair, um, and again used EEG headsets and interviews on two sets of subjects. And this time, rather than changing the bandwidth, introduced uh, artificial latency within the uh, connectivity. So she'd add 500 milliseconds to one side and, and leave it native with the other. And again, I mean, you've got positive and negative phrases in each section, but obviously within the fast, the fast version, easy to use, in the slow section, slow, basic, clunky. Um, so clearly, we want to try and um, reduce the stress of our customers by, by optimizing the performance. But what, you know, <laughs> That's all very well and good, it's all a bit hippie, let's be nice to our customers by uh, reducing their stress. But what really matters to the business is, uh, is the money at the end of the day. Um, and when we look at the commercial metrics, there's, there's reeves of these um, 
reams of these uh, studies that show how abandonment, uh, this was one that uh, our friends Gomez and a, a Dutch company, MeasureWorks, did a couple of years ago, which shows that abandonment rate goes up massively, so basket abandonment rate goes up massively as you increase load time. So Apple is better. Hmm? So Apple is better. In, in this particular, yeah. <laughs> well, I should use it. Yeah, they're, more, they're more, uh, more committed to the purchase. Apple has the problem. Yeah, they're more, more committed to the per, to the purchase, I think, is the, uh, is the thing with uh, Apple customers. Um, <laughs> did you still know what's going wrong? <laughs> um, bounce rate and conversion, again, um, one of our customers uh, did a big um, performance optimization program. Um, which, um, a, a massive project that they hugely reduced their page load times and the, the thing they found was the advance rate was six times better, um, conversions were up 28% um, and page views doubled. Um, the, the one I've got, the stats I find quite amazing is Mozilla apparently shaved 2.2 seconds off their landing page um, which resulted in a in an extra 60 million more Firefox downloads per year, which seems astonishing for you know, the population of the UK extra. Um, but that's their, that's their conversion stats anyway. And basket size, I couldn't find any really reliable stats on basket size, but there's a lot of talk about it in the, in the community about how um, you know, a faster site um, creates bigger baskets, bigger, bigger transactions at the end of the day. And, you know, you know that you know that instinctively that if you go to Amazon to buy a camera um, and the experience is good, then you may well end up buying the camera bag and the memory chip and the uh, and the um, whatever that's called well, tripod. Thank you. But if the if the experience is poor, uh, then. You're, you may still go and buy the camera, but nothing else. So the opportunity to cost sell and upsell reduces with um, increased download time and performance. Um, and ultimately, it's all about revenue. Um, again, Amazon Amazon study showed um, a hundred millisecond delay would account to one percent um, redu reduction in sales. Um, Walmart came up with exactly the same numbers, interestingly enough. And obviously, these guys are high volume high transactional volume, low value sales businesses, but um, those are astonishing numbers. Um, and even if you can, could equate a tenth of that to, to every e-commerce business, there's a clear um, value benefit to, uh, to optimizing the performance. So, um, and it's not just, not just about the uh, money, the, the top line is also about the bottom line, you know, where, where can we save money? The Seatwave, um, again, um, they found that they were able to reduce their CPU usage significantly by looking at front-end optimization, um, reduce their bandwidth requirements by looking at front obviously, obviously um, uh, by, by doing front-end optimization, and also increase the concurrent users. So, so saving off, you know, the, the, the customers in our world don't do capacity planning. They, they put it live, they monitor it, see what happens, um, and keep and, and, and do it like that. So. Call <laughs> yeah. um, but at least they've got good monitoring data for UTUs. Oh, cool. um, and, and so they found that you know they could, the, the huge operational savings by by just optimising the front end before they'd even looked at the database and the application and, uh, and so on. So um, you know the the. the what we hear back to this is, yeah, but everyone's getting, you know, MBNs rolling out, everyone's getting faster and faster bandwidth, and, you know, what, what, we don't care about the size of our web pages, we don't, because uh, people are getting faster and faster connections. Um, but the reality is bandwidth doesn't actually help um, beyond a certain point, or not much anyway. Uh, a chap called Mike Belch did a study um, a couple of years ago that looked at the <coughs> download pages, and as you can see, you know, there's a big jump between 1 meg and 2 meg um, in the, um, the performance benefit, but and you know, a bit of a jump between two meg and ten meg. But you can see that what the direction that curve's going in, and give us a hundred meg, you're still not going to get a much, uh, much greater improvement. The other option is throw more tin at it, um, and you know, it, it, <laughs> you, you know the answer to that one. But again, you know, it's, a, it's feedback we get a lot. So we talk about, which is why we talk about um, front end 
pack up on that one, so what was he laughing for? Oh, because you know, I sort of mentioned at the beginning, we get, you speak to the guys, so, oh, you know, we don't worry about capacity management or you know, performance management because we're just throwing more tin in it. But tin is so fast now and so cheap that the bottlenecks are not in capacity. The bottlenecks are around, you know, it could be code or it could be more like settings in your middleware, <coughs> settings in your database, settings in your browser. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. so it's... it's, it's latency. Yeah. We did a, we were sat and watched, we just worked for content. Yeah. And they said, we just can't kind of one of these, we'll just get a bit of a new box. Yeah. We sat at a, or oh, sat at a, at a user group type thing. We looked at the cost of the box. The cost of the box in six weeks to change by a quarter of a million dollars. And that was because of the Australian dollar change rates. Box. And that's it, it got, it got up about a quarter of a million dollars simply because of the Australian dollar. <coughs> that's what you're after, it's a three tin, it's not a solution. And the cost of the tin is only 10% of total cost. Mm -hmm. So if you look at facilities management, software software costs, yeah. they're yeah. horrible, yeah. basic charge. <laughs> so it's only 10%, so if, you, if your hardware cost went up a quarter of a million dollars, multiply, multiply it by seven or eight, costs. Yeah. it's huge, absolutely massive. Whereas you can do a lot more in, in your case to find an optimization. Yeah. And what we see is a lot of stuff you can do even beyond that, where people you know, they roll out new versions of hardware and software. They don't like it's just an out of the box implementation. They don't look at well you know, how many threads, how many how much memory shall I allocate to my JVM? You know, is there, you know, how much caching do we have? <coughs> how many JDB sessions are JDBC sessions are available? That's right. Isn't it? Twice is like simple 101 stuff, but these things have been rolled out left, front, and centre. So you know, one of the reasons why I'm up here is we're looking at one, one of these uh, application issues out in um, uh, out in and it's, 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 it's opportunity rich, shall we say? It's been opportunity rich since 2011, from what we've seen. And it's yeah, they've thrown so much hardware at it that it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Yeah, it's probably just one, as you said, a couple of settings. It's like a whole bunch of stuff, right? Yeah. And um, each one gives me the yeah, they, Those days of hardware, it's, it, they can't go. Like they throw so much hardware at it, and they go, okay, what's next? And then they're desperate because they have no idea. Well, it moves them well, How many PNGs are you loading for one request, right? How many little AFs <laughs> crap come across? How much, how many uh, cascading style sheets come across? How much JavaScript are you loading every time you click on something? I like the way Trevor put it, which is proactive performance management, you know, being ahead of the curve. And it's, well, when you design these new changes, or when you put out this new architecture, how much what are you giving to performance? And you know, we get to see a lot of the crap that's out there. But you know, um, how, mu how much of that you put in the pre-thinking? Like well, Nick was saying, you know, the architecture, the solution architecture. How much performance engineering you put in that? It's not. Much. It's it's we're seeing we're seeing less and less of them over the time. I mean, some of the, some of the slower web pages are just massively chapped. The, 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 problem, the problem we see is that, that the performance has moved out of the domain of the people that own the, own the systems and moved into the people, the domain of the people that own the content. And that's, that's kind of the preamble to, to, to what this presentation is all about, is that the web ops guys get it. They get why performance is important and they've come from that world. Um, and, they, and, and they need to persuade the business. You know, that, that image is massive to say that. So how do you change the mindset of these people then, rather than just throwing hardware at it, to actually well, dig deeper and look beyond just the hardware? By, by showing, basically by showing quick, by showing really quick wins, um, and that's you know that's what what we're leading on to here is you know big service they don't answer don't answer it all. Um, this is the, the a performance graph of a typical web page. Um, all of, all of these big bars. You know, this is time along here. All these big bars, they come from their front end performance. Um, the back end, the, the, you know, you might include these data start times, the time first bytes here as a, a application response for some of that. But ultimately, um, a lot of the, uh, if you're looking at a 10 second downloaded web page, it, or 10 second response time web page, it's not in the application. Applications are not taking 10 seconds to respond. It's the JavaScript, the CSS, um, the ridiculous number of connections that some people are, are adding to their site. So there are some really quick, easy wins that don't cost any money. 
um, you know, costed a little bit of a little bit of engineering time. Um, so, but we have to start with measurements, and that's you know that's part of part of the problem is what do we actually measure? Because obviously, you know, there's, there's contentious issues around download time as a, as a measurement of performance, because you know, that's including um, non-visual objects, so it's including below the fold stuff, uh, it's including all the um, all the ridiculous numbers of marketing tags, and does that actually have an impact on the user experience? Because ultimately, it's only the ex performance of user experience we care about. So people start. So, so you start to think about render time. Do we start measuring render time? And, and the reason I put this graph up is that this is a, a site where the render time is at four and a half seconds. But at nine seconds, we still don't even know whose website it is. Um, ASOS, obviously a market leader in e-commerce, render image, you know, done within six seconds. Um, so. There's no different to the actual content that's on these sites. They're all selling the same stuff. They're all selling um, apparel um, to the consumer, and you know they've all got roughly the same amount of money to spend on their on their kit, on their tin. They might. The difference with ASOS is they spend more money on their engineers. They have bigger teams of people to 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 be able to do this. I wouldn't buy from there if that was me. Hmm? But I wouldn't buy from their side if they took nine seconds to surrender. It's isn't it? They, they're reward winners as well. So um, these guys do get the advantage of your second visit. Um, it's better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is first visit. There's, there's no, no denying that. Um, but then, we, but then we, that's part of, the, part of um, front end engineering is to get your, your, your caching rules <coughs> correct and um, you know, yeah, lots of problems. This guy's a cheap. Yeah, but so it's not us. No, well, what I often use these guys is you persevere because they are cheap. Mm. So they're throwing away profit. You know, kissing these guys investing more up front, maybe maybe a bit of margin. Yeah, they're they're, they're, in, they're investing in, in it's the different priorities and, and actually um, the difference I think between uh, the UK organisations and the Australian ones is that their market is bigger. To be fair, so they've got more money to spend. They've been doing it for a lot longer, so they've already got the platforms in place. They're already running Hybris or ATG, or, or, or they're not still stuck on a Magento platforms or some bespoke um, Drupal thing. Or, um, so is this going to be more about giving the business choice? So the business has a choice of how much they invest in performance, and how much they invest in <coughs> user experience, and how much they invest in functionality, and how much they invest in Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's making the performance's case for that, a slice of that pie. And, and, and also, I mean, we would always say that, also so that performance, performance is user experience as well. So it's important to, it's very important to talk about performance as, as a measure of user experience rather than as a separate uh, entity in itself, but we can spend all this time and money and uh, an effort in inching out um, extra seconds of application response time, um, but your front end is still performing <coughs> performing badly. Um, um, and then, of course, it, so moving on from that is how do we measure? So we've got different types of things we can measure um, uh, in terms of download time, response time, uh, um, sorry, render time. Um, um, Dom ready time when the when the when the page is um, interactive, um, but there's also different ways of measuring it, and and the answer is that all of these things are necessary. You know, we've always had infrastructure, we've always used Nagios or similar. Um, APMs have been around for a long time. Obviously, we've got the new the new breed of APMs moving in, but also um, synthetic um, and user based. Um, Measure, performance measurements are really important here. Um, real user measurement and synthetic user measurement enable you to um, to to be able to see, drive the performance improvement. Every, I mean, in, in capacity world, you know the need for, for performance uh, for monitoring. Sorry, um, to be able to drive performance, you can't tell how you're how you're doing if you're not monitoring correctly. Um, I think we have a saying. You can't measure it, you can't prove it. Absolutely. I mean, it, whatever you do, whether you're running a race, whether you're going on a diet, you know, you've got to, you know, you've got to stand on the scales and, and, and go on a diet. Well done. No, <laughs> um, Don't talk about diets after pizza. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you, you have to be able to measure it. And, and, uh, um, uh, uh, 
we t we talk about taking our, our customers. There's different, you know, all of those tools are necessarily part of a, part of a, um, a performance improvement program. Um, and we talk about taking our customers on a journey that, you know, we've, we've been doing this for 13 odd years now, and, and even um, in a more advanced e-commerce environment of the UK, you know, back then people just cared about trying to get their site to stay up for more than 20 hours at a time, or their mire for more than a few days at a time. But um, and, and stability and availability was what it was all about. You then move into scalability. So can I hand, handle the, um, uh, the, the load? Optimizing the back end, that's the obvious, obvious place to go next. And that's where your APM tools and your um, uh, and, um, traditional performance testing tools come in. People start, that's when people start to realize that, yeah, we've you know, we're, we're eking out an extra second or two of response time from our, from our application, but we're still taking 10 seconds of land load. And that's where the, the front-end optimization comes. And then it's about trying to manage the fact that you've got users in all sorts of geographies, on all sorts of devices, and how to optimize them all. Um, and my um, uh, animations on PowerPoint don't work properly, so that all appears at once. Um, and so you start with, with basic synthetic monitoring, and that's where, where we Take up the, the journey we take our customers. When you move to load testing, introduce APMs, introduce real browser testing using web page test or, or similar tools, and then move into the real user monitoring where we're capturing um, the real performance data of every user um, on, on every device, on every interaction with the site. Which is brilliant, wonderful information, um, but not necessarily the most useful for the basic. Uh, levels of uh, driving performance and um, so just talking about the, the real user monitoring versus synthetic which is, in our world is a hot, hot topic for debate um, it tends to sit in two different camps and, and our view really is that, that they're just two different tools for two different jobs um, what these graphs are showing us is, is that as you would expect real user data um, has a spread of performance whatever your site is doing, if your site's performing well, um, or if it's performing badly, uh, or if it's performing consistently, or if it's performing erratically, you're still going to get a spread of performance because they're real users in real uh, different scenario test environments. Whereas a synthetic test can provide, yeah, you probably can't see, there's six tests in the four second range, 2008 in the three second range, so that's a BBC website which, con which conforms consistently. Um, and consistently well, uh, and, and what synthetic, um, good synthetic monitoring enables you to do is to see how you're driving the, the, the performance there, and not try and second guess the spread of uh, the spread of performance, whether it's to do with the user population or whether it's to do with your your site. Um, synthetic testing um, is all about consistency, um, is all about uh, rel uh, the repeatability of the tests. Uh, okay. Some of uh, my colleagues get cross at me when I wax lyrical about uh, the theory of relativity and, uh, in, in website monitoring. But it, you know, it's all about the perspective of the observer. Uh, you wouldn't use a ruler like that. Um, so the same applies to, to uh, testing, synthetic monitoring and testing. And you need to have consistency um, in your data to be able to see the performance changes uh, that are occurring, whether they're performance changes because of your environment, or whether their performance changes because of your uh, optimization efforts. Um, and what you can clearly see here is that the kind of step changes that happen, and these are dramatic changes from four seconds to, to nearly six seconds, uh, that can occur from a single release or a single change to an image. I mean, we don't know, obviously, just from this graph alone, that something happened at two o'clock one afternoon. Um, uh, um, uh, which caused the, 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 page, the damage times to dramatically change, but in a consistent way. And then obviously earlier in the morning we've got these spikes, so you know, opportunities to, to investigate significant performance changes. Do you have any of your customers that ask you to run parallel synthetic testing against their site and their competitive site? Yes. Yeah, all the, Very time. all the time, yeah, okay. Ty typical. And how far will they let you go in terms of load on their competitor site? You would never load a competitor's site. Okay. 
ethically, or even do anything that would interact with their databases. So you might load their load their home pages, but you wouldn't you wouldn't abandon their cards. So you wouldn't do it. You're not doing a, a synthetic test. Yeah, right. synthetic with just single user. Trying to do it. Just, yeah, that's not a load. Yeah. Yeah. Synthetic testing wouldn't be loading it up significantly. Um, and, uh, it would, you know, typically we would just be looking at simple home page type monitoring or... Yeah. or yeah. And that's not that comparison. Yeah. The, it, some of the, actually, so this page is up. People like Sanctuary and Tesco, but their car, cart abandonment rates are so high kind of don't mind doing an extra abandoned cart every, <laughs> every, every 10 minutes, you know, it won't actually um, change them. Um, but this is an example of, of um, you know, what, what the opportunity is like. Um, this is, uh, you know, the speed of Coles, Woolies, Sainsbury's and Tesco's. For those of you who don't know, Sainsbury's and Tesco's are basically the equivalent of Coles and Woolies in the UK. Um, the speed is a graph. <laughs> Funnily enough, mirrors the page size graph. It's not, but you know, that's not rocket science. Um, the bigger the page, the slower it is. But the opportunity um, is there. And in fact, if I, I've got my computer, my technology working, I can even show you what that looks like. Um, yeah, you see, technology doesn't always work as it's planned. All we're seeing at the moment while it's loading is. Um Whilst the page actually loads up really well, because we're doing a lot of analytics around users' interaction and big data around what they're doing and how they're interacting to specifically give them ads related to what they're looking for, that's the bit that takes a while. Yeah. So it, it uses their history, it uses the, and it's the ads that take another six seconds to load up because it's crunching the numbers and hey, I'm going to give them one a second. And, then, and there's a really complex business decision to be taken there that says, well, how important is that ad? For me, and that you know, it's very difficult to, to answer that. Um, uh, but you know, company like news, it's massive because yeah, I mean, it's a, it's one hundred of the revenue. Of but you need the eyeballs on the on the page in the first place. News, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you need the eyeballs on the page in the first place as well. So you want the, you need that seamless movement between between pages. You don't want to have to wait while an ad loads for the DOM to be ready to be able to click on a link to get to the next article if you're, if you're looking at the, um, you know, yeah, the, the, the section headings. You know, oh, that's the article I want to read. But I'm waiting for that ad to load. Um, so it's a complex... It's all the reverse the world that help you. Complex decision for you. Yeah, and, it, and there's all sorts of different opportunities for the way that the ads are off, offloaded. And once you start getting to your real-time media, um, streaming media, and how you're managing the um, content management of the um, ads into into video content. And that was far more content. I was going to say, say this, is, mandatory. <laughs> this is another component to the mix, right? Like you've got your caching, you've got your different um, items and images loading on the page, and then you've got your predictive advertisements or like site for CMS that you know see what user is coming in. Go, oh, it's that person that wants to have a trip to some holiday. Summerland destination. Let's give them images and ads associated to that. So, a site for, I mean, they experience performance issues too. But there are so many moving parts to it. You just go, where do I look first, right? That's it. Absolutely. Um, I mean, and th th there's no easy answer. It, it, you know, there are there's some certain rules around web performance optimization, but there's no easy answer. Yeah. Comes back to how do we and the different ways of measuring it, and that's why. Getting data balance as well. You want to make sure your, your page is, is optimized, but you don't want to piss off the tip, you don't want to piss off the customer as well, right? Like the bandwidth. The, the aesthetics and the functionality <coughs> really have to come first. Yep. The, you know, the business is building a website for a reason. It's not to go fast, it's building a website to sell stuff. And if you haven't got a basket application in there, and if it doesn't look nice <coughs> and it's not presenting the goods well, it's pointless. Yep. But, I mean, you look at the, 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 the Tesco site, um, this is actually slowed down, otherwise Tesco's would be too quick to see it. Um, but you know, there's, nothing, there's no compromise there. Um, that's a fully functioning website, fully imaged up, um, and it downloads in 1.9 seconds. Um, Did you test that for the UK? No, just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, and, um, but I mean, interestingly, that's, it, that's your, your Tesco's downloads. Um, 
uh, waterfall chart. And I've seen it better than that. And at the moment, they seem to have had all these extra um, uh, carousel images in. But I've seen it with seven objects, 0.7 of a, a second. So, so that's, what, that's where we can get to. And now, now, your APM stuff is super important because that's the only, you know, that's the only thing stopping further performance um, in that. And, and in fact, when um, Steve Souders looked at uh, front end versus back end performance thing, this, this is what he found was that he calls it the 80 20 rule 20% of performance is in the back end and 80% in the front end. What he actually found was that the top performing websites, it was more like 40 60. Because once you optimize that front end, then there's a lot more, a lot more going on in the back end. And the poor performing websites are all in the front end. Where was that test taken? Uh, this test was, um, well, the test was taken from the UK. Be a factor? So? It will have some. It will have some. It will have some. It's a little bit biased. It's still from here. It will have some. But, uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the reality will also ultimately come down to the. Um, yeah. the the actual internet packet between Australia and UK is very low. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've got websites in the UK that I run, they crap from here, but in the UK they're very fast. Yeah. <laughs> so it'll be interesting if you did the same test here. Yeah. Um, I'm sure the CDM will kick in. Yeah, yeah uh, to get the side by side, I need to do them from, from the same location, but I, I, I have run them from the uh, same from the US. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but ultimately, it's really simple, you know, to get to that sort of stage. Um, that's a lot of hard engineering, but we don't all need to get that far. Tesco's are making the, the huge, you know, tiny percentage changes make a difference, so they, they invest a lot of it. But it's really simple. There are, you know, some. There's more than this. Obviously, more more you can do at the front end. But it's amazing how many people don't bother compressing their images, um, ordering their CSS and their JavaScript. Removing white space, Compre the number of people that don't even put GZIP compression on their text, textual content. Big websites, so, you know, making lots of money, and they, they need a few command strokes on the web server to to improve the performance of their website. Um, and cache control is, is generally poor around the world. Um, this is an example of a major retailer uh, with I can't remember how many it is there, hundred and. 70 something objects, you know, doesn't matter what you're doing with your, um, uh, with your tin, with your bandwidth, with, with anything, if you've got that many round, round trip requests, um, all of the, all these yellow bits incidentally are SSL handshake, and God knows why that's happening, they're, they're, they're um, calling in third party tags securely for, um, well, what was the reaction when you showed the this? Um, well, I haven't got to speak to them yet, unfortunately. Oh, <laughs> but, but no, but you know what? I mean, I have other customers with, with not quite so bad, um, and uh, and they'll say, they'll say, oh, well, I don't really know how to fix it. And I said, well, well that's the point. We can tell you that oh, I don't have the resource to fix it. I've got other things to worry about. It's the colour of the buttons is more important. Um, and that it, it frustrates us because, I mean, to me, it, it's clear and it's it's relatively easy sure. to fix. So it's interesting on that point. One of the things that we're just part of from seeing in GA is in having the message further up in the hierarchy. So in your case, the guy that you're talking to, obviously, you know, he's focused on the colour of the button. Yeah. <laughs> have you tried games not like that business? So, have you tried getting f further up or maybe into the businesses? Yeah, well, we are talking to business actually, and that's, and that's the, see, actually, we have far more success when we talk to web ops or to the DevOps teams because, because they do get it. They understand why measurement's important. Um, we, you know, our, our target market is, 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 is obviously websites, clearly, but it's e commerce. Um, uh, major, uh, big, some big financial in, um, financial services, some big media companies as well, but, but predominantly e-commerce for obvious reasons because you can marry the metrics so quickly. And, you know, this is your shop front. You know, it makes sense. So we're talking to the business, but the business is so f is so focused on these other priorities, and that and that's the thing. It's not because they don't care. We show dollar cost opportunity wise yeah. versus um, this crap. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't get me wrong. It works a lot of the time. I'm in the job <laughs> for that reason. 
Um, but there's a lot more we can do. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's, um, yeah. The thing is, with all those as well, there's a design and, and functionality that they yeah. want to let go of as well. And, and this is what, what I'm still passionate about. about, how it looks and like, yeah. I love it, I don't want to change it. And, and this was what I was talking about with Hybris out of the box, is that out of the box, it's loading all your JavaScript, all your um, interactive components as individual little JavaScript files, and, uh, and, and you need to just tell it to, to not do it. And, I mean, this is, this is uh, one that's just showing you different requests per domain. Um, uh, and so basically, this is their domain. And these are all third-party domains, so they're bringing in all that content, um, Facebook, um, Google Analytics, Critio, ad servers. So we know a little bit about that third-party content and why. Mm -hmm. I think we know a bit more about why they're bringing in that third-party content. Yeah. Um, because it is how they're working with a variety of their ad agencies to prioritize their ads on third-party sites, specifically yeah. on payrolls and so on. Um, so you'll see um, a lot of sites will call in a JavaScript library from a, like a tag bidder, a tag bidder. And then to try and get around that, they're calling in those different third parties on different pages. Yeah. So on your first page, you might randomly get double clicks, so Google's ads, and that'll get you your third party cookie for there. And on your next page, you'll get another one. And that way, instead of getting 35 to 40 of the external ad agencies on the first page, you'll get it progressively over your business. Yeah. Um, and it is tricky because it introduces a privacy aspect, but generally for their flexibility on how they're going to market in a reverse option for bidding for you know, ad spots on, on websites, that seems to be the, the flavor du jour to do that. Get, yeah. get, get support for as many third-party ad agencies as you can, and that way when you go to market and you're buying ad space, you can go to as many providers as possible, knowing that each of them will already have a third-party cooking for you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. The perfectly, you know, the business drivers for doing it yeah. exist because it's about the balancing act. So yeah. again, and, um, and there are and there are, you know, people like Tagman providing the tag management solutions where you can introduce a single tag container that does all of that for you. It also ensures um, assures you that you've you've got. Um, synchronous downloading tags, there's no asynchronous single points of failure and all that sort of thing. Because you've got to, uh, as, a, as a web ops guy, you've got to make sure every single one of those um, tags is not going to break your site if it goes down. Like, I mean, like the, the, the Facebook outage a few weeks ago that took down huge numbers of sites from a tag not working and, and well, not taking the sites down, but, you know, yeah, killing, <laughs> killing the user experience. Um, uh, reducing image size is another classic sin. Um, this one is, is this sector here and this uh, 1. 1.4, 1. 1.5 mega, uh, sorry, uh, 1.15 mega of, of images in a, in a single page. And six of these images are over 130k. One of them is 274 and unfortunately my technology thing has failed me because I tried it on the way here and there. Um, but I, I did have a link to the image, um, which is still live, even though this was taken uh, over a year ago. Um, and it's just red. It's basically just red with some text in it. And it's 274 kilobytes. And it's just astonishing how easy. And, and sadly, these people are actually customers of ours, and we've told them again and again and again. So even when they're bought in to the, the concept, it still takes a lot of effort. Um, Combining JavaScript and CSS, someone talked about that earlier. Um, another classic sin. Um, these, all, most of these JavaScript, CSS, JavaScript, 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 JavaScript. And they're all downloading synchronously, um, asynchronously, sorry. Um, and, and, and taking up loads and loads of time there. I think so, you know, all the way down there. Um, and, and you've even got a CSS down here. So you can't, you can't even stop. Painting the image, painting the page until you've got all the star sheets. Um, yeah. We really did stuff. this on our HTML <coughs> site. We did the bundling on the JS. It's double, it's double loading. It's so easy. Yeah. So easy. Combine it, minify yeah. it, yeah. Um, take out the white space, keep it in UAT commented and nicely, <coughs> nicely viewable. Yeah. But, but 
but have a process that, that puts that into the production side. And make sure you don't put CSS down here, because you can't start painting the images until, you can't start rendering the, the page until your, your content, uh, uh, your style sheets are all within the DOM. Um, uh, and that's pretty much the end of my presentation. So, but the, the, the other point to say is that it's not just about, um, you know, uh, it's the same in all aspects of performance engineering. It's not just about a one-off project. Um, but in the e-commerce world, they often see it as such. So there will be a huge amount of effort that goes into a launch optimization project. Um, and then, of course, new functionality gets added and new content. Uh, and and the, uh, um, slowly you see the page loads so I'm creeping back up again. Uh, and there we go. Any thoughts, questions? You're lucky, I was just about to cut you off because Trevor said I'm leaving and you're going to be timekeeper, so if uh, Julian goes over, stop him. But thank you very much, I think that was really good. Just a point to add to that, it's really important, I think, you know, some of the companies that I speak to from the digital marketing team, they like invest, you know, millions, and I'm talking like tens of millions of dollars in search engine optimization because they want their websites to rank higher. But they don't realize that if the performance is down, that investment that they make in their SEO doesn't actually, it, it goes to waste because they don't rank as high, right? So, um, so many levels of synthetic, uh, just the, the whole monitoring aspect from an end user is so important. Well, it, so. Yeah, and even the paid um, adverts, even your paid clicks, they the cost of those adverts to you take, in not only, take into account not only the competitiveness of the, of the words, but also the relevancy of your site. And one of the ways of measuring relevancy is bounce rate. So, how many people visit your homepage and then plug it straight off again? <coughs> and as we see, performance directly relates to, to bounce rate. So, so it's costing you more to acquire customers by having a slow site. You're earning less money out of those customers, and it's costing you more to deliver to them because of the operational costs. We do a lot of load testing projects with customers where we're, where um, synthetic load testing, akin to um, uh, other tools I'm sure you're, you're, you're familiar with, but. But we go in there first and we say, well, before we do the load testing, let's, let's optimize the front end because you're wasting your money load testing a website if you've got all those big images there that we could easily compress. So, you know, as with the Seagrave example of 300% um, on their concurrent users through optimization, you know, let's, let's clean out the front end before we start looking at the back end. But by all means, look at the back end. Thank you very much.